When life throws you a curveball, how are you going to handle adversity? Welcome to the Fearless Mindset Podcast, where you're about to go on a journey as I interview security, business, and entertainment leaders on what it takes to stay fearless. I'm your host, Mark Ludlow, and enjoy today's episode. Hello, everybody. This is Mark Ludlow with the Fearless Mindset Podcast, and our guest today is the icon himself, Fred Burton. And he had uh, some time he could scratch it to help out and uh, share his knowledge and expertise in the uh, podcast. And uh, Fred, thanks for coming on and sharing your experiences with us. Mark, thank you so much for having me. You're very kind. Yeah, you know, Fred, we've, uh, you know, the elephant in the room, you know, there's no hidden secret. We got November 3rd coming around the corner and uh, everybody wishes somebody had the crystal ball to predict what's going to happen in the U.S., you know, before and after. And that's the biggest thing everybody's, you know, fearful of is the unknown. And that fear factor alone makes everybody just kind of go crazy and not, if not nauseous. And uh, what's, what's the comfort you can offer from your expertise? You, you've been a contributor on, like you said earlier, um, many TV networks, Fox News to CNN with Anderson Cooper to CNBC. I mean, you've talked to a lot of people. Your your wisdom is very sought after. What, what's your thoughts on all that? Well, Mark, I think it's important that uh, we we keep things in perspective, meaning, you know, as a nation, we, we have certainly been here before. And as you look back over time, you know, each decade, starting with the 60s, has brought unusual challenges for the corporate security space. And I think that as you look over time, we have certainly seen that in the late 60s and the early 70s, this was actually a much more violent time period here in the continental United States. And that's where the sector really starts to take off in our business, meaning we have bombings of multinational corporations and government office buildings. And you had groups like the Black Panther Party in the Cleaver faction. You had the Weather Underground. Uh, so you had uh, attacks inside the United States at a steady tempo that uh, far surpassed what we're seeing today with some of our uh, protest activity around the country. And our nation was on fire. So, you know, from my perspective, as you look towards the election, uh, I think that we are in a very unstable time period, but uh, I'm highly optimistic that uh, we will have uh, calm before the storm. Uh, I do believe that we'll see protest activity depending upon who is elected, whether it's President Trump or a Biden administration, because you're going to have 50% of America that's going to be at minimum outraged. So I think there's some degree of just Uh, anticipated problems as a result of that. But, you know, quite frankly, uh, especially in our post 9-11 world, I mean, you know this from your Marine Corps days, you know, uh, we have a very good uh, Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, Joint Terrorism Task Forces and Violent Crime Task Forces and State Fusion Centers are are up and running monitoring these threats. So, you know, I'm optimistic that law enforcement and the intelligence community will be able to contain any problems that may flyer, might flare up. That's really reassuring that you have the confidence in those agencies, you know, for law enforcement and for community and public safety. That's, uh, that's a huge, uh, uh, I guess, relieving the pressure off the valve, so to speak. And, uh, yeah, because I know that's the, the biggest question I'm hearing from, you know, my industry colleagues throughout the country is, hey, uh, what can we expect? You know, you know, of course, guys in the private sector like myself, well, are we going to get busier or it's going to get worse? Or how can we predict, you know, since COVID-19 hit, um, the industry has just been shut down because, A, the executives are not traveling. So the EP side of the house has disintegrated. They're all sitting at home doing, you know, Zoom like we are and doing their conference calls with their shareholders, I'm sure. And so that's the biggest thing is, well, how is this going to affect my budget? And that's, uh, you know, it's probably, like you said, it's going to be okay. You know, whoever gets elected, you know, America will keep on running as it always has been in every election. Yeah, I think so, Mark. I mean, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. I, I think that from, a, especially from an executive protection standpoint, you know, COVID has certainly changed 
protocols and the narrative, and, and you know this from your own executive protection work that, you know, the world has shifted and the mm-hmm. pandemic has brought new challenges upon, uh, uh, you know, a down upon the industry. And going forward, I, I do think that health is going to be, you know, the new frontier for executive protection work, whether that be, you know, how we sanitize uh, limousines, uh, how do we minimize perhaps advance security officer travel? Is there a way to look at uh, a, a cadre of dedicated drivers, for example, uh, or uh, security contractors that are in different cities that, that, you know, we all have our own networks that we trust to get the job done. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, for me, this is also an interesting time because uh, we, we will see new technology develop out of this. Uh, we will see new protocols come into play. And, and I think it's a wonderful time for our industry uh, to think about how we are going to redo things. And uh, so, you know, for me, I, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I, I do think that, you know, the pandemic uh, is something that's going to still be with us in the foreseeable future. And then, of course, we're coming up to the flu season, which I think might uh, amplify some of the current problems that we have. So, you know, we're not out of the woodwork yet by any stretch of the imagination. So uh, how we adapt, uh, you know, as an industry, it, you know, we will. And I think there's going to be a lot of lessons learned come out of this uh, from a contingency planning and just from an emergency action planning, which may spin off, you know, new jobs inside this sector as well, uh, being able to manage some of these events going forward. Yeah, this issue you mentioned that uh, about COVID-19, probably with the flu season coming in, I talked to, I just talked to uh, Mickey Winston uh, with over at Spotify, and he, that was three weeks ago, and he said he's been hearing that England is even considering shutting down again here this fall because of they're having a resurge in COVID-19 cases already, and they're here in Europe is starting to spike up again. Yeah, I, I'm certainly not surprised. I mean, if you look at some of the trending, uh, it's, uh, it's problematic and troubling, uh, especially if you're in the international security space. You know, your regional security officers, you know, have got a, a tough time. But on the flip side, you know, there's certainly less uh, international travel, less international executive travel. Uh, but, you know, how we rethink these kinds of times to me is something that our industry is just going to have to shift and adjust to. And, and, you know, I've been uh, favorably optimistic when you looked at, for, if you look, for example, on LinkedIn at some of the jobs that are being created, I mean, every day there's new executive protection positions that appear to be opening up. Uh, You know, there's a lot of opportunities still in space for individuals that, you know, want to change or, or move or relocate. I think some of the, the problems in our business have historically been, you know, if you get set in a certain sector, whether you only work executive protection and you only want to stay, for example, in Dallas, Texas, well, you and I both know that that is very, um, you know, minimizing from a career perspective that in many ways you have to be flexible enough that you want to travel or relocate. But, you know, I do think that, that companies are hiring in our space which is a positive move. And I think it also gives us an opportunity to just rethink how we go about doing things and from a best practices perspective as well. Yeah, speaking of best practices, um, um, I know we just had an incident in Denver, Colorado, and uh, I know they don't have all the details yet. I really haven't dug too much into it. I see a lot of stuff on social media being said about that agent and what company is working for what, what is your uh, solution to that problem to mitigate, mitigate those risks? What, what are your, your advice to those companies out there that are trying to stay afloat and trying to pay the bills and taking anything they can to just get some money in their pocket? What's your professional advice on that? Well, I think that this is a lesson learned wake up call for companies hiring security officers to do any kind of job per se. Meaning, you know, I know why uh, news outlets 
uh, reach out for security. We, we know why. You know, we have horrific examples of that. For example, I believe it was in North Carolina a few years back when that disgruntled employee came back and, and shot and killed the reporter uh, during a live uh, TV shoot. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's troubled times in that sector. Uh, when you start looking at covering some of this protest violence, you know, but the takeaway from this, in my judgment, is that you really do have to make sure what professional services you are recruiting for and hiring for and, and making sure that the individuals that are engaged in whatever work it might be, you know, are, uh, have all the uh, checks put into place from a requirement perspective to be licensed to work uh, in, in whatever field that they're doing. You know, I just think that that's just good practices. Now, you know, in fairness to the client at times, uh, they may not know to delve down into the weeds. So uh, again, I think that there's going to be a lot of things come out of that incident uh, that uh, is going to be enlightening for those of us in this professional security space. I definitely, from when my colleagues have been calling me all weekend, I hearing that it's going to probably definitely change the game as far as expectations by clients, because they're going to go, um, I just heard about that shooting in Denver, Colorado. Um, um, here are the questions from legal. Legal counsel is going to probably get involved because there's going to be insurance payouts and all that. And so was, I'm sure it's going to make major shifts happen in the industry going forward in 2021. It's, it has to. Yeah, it has to. And, you know, Mark, uh, I, I've... I've been a big believer in baseline threat assessments uh, since the early 1980s when I got in this business. Meaning, uh, if you look at some of the violence that's unfolding around the country in certain areas, that uh, I think that that's one mistake that, that companies do make. And to be quite blunt, security services at times, by just throwing resources potentially at a problem, without stepping back and doing a baseline threat assessment as to what are the vulnerabilities and the risks and the groups that could be targeting your client or in some cases actually targeting you. So, you know, from my perspective, that's another thing that's going to come out of this from once the dust settles that, you know, you got to make sure that you're doing a good baseline threat assessment and that you have a protective intelligence capability uh, that's in place that you can actually look and monitor for threats that are out there. And, you know, I think we've all, whether you've been in the government or out of the government and working in both sectors, you know, we've all been in very volatile situations at times where it doesn't take much for things to go sideways and that um, the more information or the more intelligence that you have uh, regarding the individual or company or people that you're protecting, the better off you're always going to be. Great. Yeah. Great point. You got to have those assessments done, know your situation, know your environment. Now in that situation that happened yesterday in November, I dig a little deeper on that. Um, was it a case where the guy had pepper spray and he pepper sprayed the guy that had the gun? And I also read somewhere there those two guns found in that location. Do you know much any more detail than that on that incident? No, I've not uh, seen uh, the actual TikTok of what took place. The only thing I have seen on social media was uh, an individual that pepper sprayed the security officer and the security officer reportedly uh, drew his firearm and fired uh, his weapon. I don't know if the individual attempted to uh, grab the gun from the security officer or exactly what took place. Uh, so I think we'll all be in better shape 24 to 36 hours from now as more details start to unfold from that. But uh, I'm not really sure of the, of the exact uh, you know, sequence of events that led up to that you know, horrific shooting. Yeah, that was pretty bad. It's a bad judgment call. And I don't, I don't have enough, you know, facts for myself to make a judgment call. I know a lot of people are doing the, you know, second screen quarterback. Well, he should have done this. He should have done that. I'm like, well, you weren't there. So you really don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, it's been my experience in this business that um, you do have to let the dust settle a little bit. I know that people don't want to hear that. Uh, right. You have to wait. <laughs> you have to wait for the facts to come out as to exactly what took place. And, uh, 
you know, it's, it's best not to, to, to look at the events based on just what is reported on social media. Uh, I, I think it's, um, you know, certainly you're, you're dealing with a very capable, you know, police department w- that has a lot of resources to be able to get to the bottom of exactly what took place to include a tremendous amount of footage already exists of, uh, of exactly what took place. I, I just know from my days of doing investigations in the past that um, those are the kinds of things that we never usually had access to. It just didn't exist because the technology didn't exist to, to capture some of the images, you know, from various attacks that transpired. So it's changed uh, the game for sure. It certainly has. And, you know, I, I think it's also, you know, for those of us in, in the business, you know, a, a vivid reminder of how quickly things can go bad. And, you know, you start thinking about just the resources devoted to that problem. I mean, you're in the business too. If you're there by yourself as a loan security officer, you know, what are you going to do? What are your resources that you have to assist you? You know, what are your contingency plans? And, and, you know, you really have to have uh, a, a, a sequence of stair steps that you have in your mind that you've thought through, you know, based on worst case scenarios, no different than a police officer driving around by his or herself in, in their police car when they're running various calls, you know. So um, anyway, it's, it's a tragic set of circumstances for everybody that was involved, obviously. Uh, but I, I, I'm, I would wait for judgment once the details come out. Great point. I really appreciate that. So I've been, you know, been at, getting phone calls all weekend regarding that. What do I think? I'm like, well, like you said, wait for the, the facts to come out in their investigation. Let the police forces do what they do best and investigate and before being second string quarterback. Um, you know, I have a lot of, a lot of younger, we have a lot of younger millennial listeners that watch my podcast. And uh, part of my, my show is to add value to the protective world. And uh, I know a lot of them are sitting at home, waiting for the phone to ring and they're all getting frustrated. We're, we have a lot of, you know, veterans that deal with PTSD issues that, from the war zone in the theater. What is your advice to those guys that try to want to get in the business and how to keep your sanity in these crazy times being a veteran trying to just, uh, pay the bills in this industry? Well, I think that uh, this is a wonderful time to start uh, and continue with education, meaning self-educate, uh, become um, as familiar as you can with trends and tactics in the industry. You know, certainly use this time for networking and for taking uh, classes that you may not have had the opportunity to take in the past. Uh, as we all know, certifications and, and continuing education is, is critical in this business. The, this sector, you know, is getting more and more relegated from that perspective when it comes to just certifications and education. But, you know, self-knowledge to me is one that, you know, I, I've been a lifelong learner, um, and uh, I always try to uh, dissect events and, and, and research them on my own. Uh, I try to stay abreast of not only industry trends, but business trends. You know, one thing that I religiously do every morning is to read the Wall Street Journal because <laughs> I, I, I want to stay abreast of all, inter, all sectors and in, in industries. And, you know, if I get a question from a CEO, I, I don't have that deer in the headlights look. At least I'm familiar with a topic that he or she may be asking me. So I think what happens a lot of times with those of us in this space, and I lived in this space for many, many years, is you get blinders on and you only study what it is that I really like to do now whether that's executive protection or site security manager, emergency action plans. Uh, and I think that this is the kind of opportunity now for us all to step back, reassess exactly what it is that you want to do for the next 20 or 30 years. And, and where is the business going? You know, where do you see the industry going five years from now, 10 years from now? Where do I see myself five to 10 years from now? And, you know, hook your wagon onto a mentor, you know, somebody that can help. 
to provide a little sage guidance and advice because you and I both know in this business, it's really a who you know business, meaning, you know, as you grow your business, you get recommendations or referrals, but there's going to consistently be people that are going to move around and remember that you have done a good job for them and, and reach back and, and may need people. Now, one of the things that I'm really, really excited about uh, since I've been in the protective intelligence space for so long is that the emergence, Mark, of protective intelligence analysts is to me the most exciting trend that I've seen in this industry in the past five years. More and more companies are hiring protective intelligence analysts. Ten years ago, you would be lucky to find one at a company. <laughs> 20 right. years ago, they didn't exist. Yep. So, you know, and, and what I encourage companies to do when they're looking to develop a protective intelligence program is to look within, see who they already have that has a great quality of mind that might have been in the military, uh, might have been uh, in an intelligence capacity somewhere else, or at least is interested in the space and can write reasonably well and develop your own. And then there's, you know, you can certainly network and join different groups uh, to become a subject matter expert in that field. But, you know, for those of you that are sitting at home looking for uh, new ways to challenge yourself, that's something I would look at too. Learn to become a protective intelligence analyst because that field is growing. Now, let's say, um, Fred, like for myself, I've never been in that space. I've always been that bodyguard, protector, EP agent most of my career, law enforcement, military course. How would I make that move? Do I need to take courses like Microsoft or is it a software type of thing? Or what, is, what does that transition look like? You'd need an apprenticeship? It, it can be literally you can define your own program, meaning uh, if uh, you are interested in that topic, uh, for example, uh, I write religiously about that uh, on our blog uh, at the um, Center for Protective Intelligence at Ontic. Uh, I have a colleague that I've worked with for years, uh, Scott Stewart at Torchstone. Uh, he and I go back years when we were agents together and started the Protective Intelligence Program at the State Department. He writes a lot about that on his blog uh, at the Torchstone website. So you can self-educate. You can read, you can attend seminars, you can join uh, online groups uh, and associations that, that focus just on protective intelligence. Um, I, I'm, I'm always open to uh, suggestions. I have uh, books that I recommend for individuals to read that you can also find as, as kind of a good starter for individuals that are interested in protective intelligence. But, you know, a, a good, um, the, the way I look at this, when I, when I talk to companies about building protective intelligence teams are that, you know, it's, it's like your days when you were in law enforcement or military. Some people are very good at just being street cops, but others also like the challenge of transitioning over and want to do criminal intelligence work. Or maybe they like the counter surveillance capacity. They like surveillance operations. So those are the kinds of persons that can easily transition into that protective intelligence role. But for me, it boils down to just having that quality of mind, uh, the ability to like to connect the dots, that they know enough about executive protection to support the mission in the field. Uh, and it, it's very easy to self-educate in this space. Yeah, that's a key component of self-educating where you don't have to spend hours and hours, you know, taking classes at college to get that. You probably need somebody to take you under their umbrella or get that entry-level position at whatever organization you're playing at. But, yeah, yeah, for example, uh, you know, we have a, um, a protective intelligence forum uh, at uh, the Center for Protective Intelligence where uh, well, you can apply – to have access to the forum. And as long as you're in the security space, you'll get access. And it's a network of just those that are interested in the protective intelligence. So I would encourage anybody that's watching this that wants to sign up for our forum, you know, please join. 
Uh, there's networking, there's articles and resources that are consistently being shared on there, you know, every day. So, you know, it's an opportunity to join like-minded individuals just to talk about uh, the field of protective intelligence. And I know, Auntie, they just had a big uh, conference, a uh, buddy of mine. I know Mike Trott was just there with you at the book signing. I think that was last year. And a bunch of people, a handful of people went to that conference they just had not too long ago. I heard it was a pretty success. Well, it was, uh, I, I have to say this, for somebody that's been in this business since the early 80s, uh, you know, I used to talk about protective intelligence in the 80s, and people would have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> right. I did the uh, keynote for the OnTech uh, Protective Intelligence Summit, and I was shocked at the turnout. Now, this year there wasn't any because of COVID, uh, but I would look for that to, you know, restart at some point in time. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the scope of Fortune 500 representatives that were there was amazing to me. I, I loved it, you know, and it was an opportunity to just network and talk to, to individuals that were laser fo focused on, on threats. We discussed a lot about how to put together a threat assessment, you know, how to evaluate and how to assess and investigate persons of interest. Uh, it was wonderful for me. I was in, uh, you know, my own environment there where, uh, you know, I really love the uh, opportunity just to chat with so many like-minded people. Yeah, I got to see a couple of videos or pictures of you and Mike Trot signing your autographs for each other because you just published a book too called uh, Under Fire, correct? Uh, well, yes, Under Fire was my book uh, about the uh, horrific events in Benghazi uh, but my last book was called uh, Beirut Rules, and that's the story of the only CIA station chief ever to be kidnapped and murdered, uh, and he was abducted in Beirut, Lebanon. And I actually worked the case when I was a special agent, and uh, so I went back and, and looked at the circumstances surrounding uh, his abduction, and uh, along with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rich Higgins of the Marine Corps that was also abducted by Hezbollah and kind of frame the, um, the hostage taking of, of the CIA station chief around uh, the horrific embassy bombings and the Marine barracks bombing in Lebanon, uh, because I think it's important in this business uh, to, to learn how we got here. And there right. was a lot of lessons learned with um, – uh, Bill Buckley's kidnapping uh, that we were able to put into place to protect uh, additional American uh, intelligence officers around the world as a result of that. As, as you and I know in this business that sometimes it takes a Benghazi or it takes a CIA station chief to be kidnapped for changes to occur, much like we're seeing now with COVID. Right. True. True. And what's the, um, I know, some politicians call it the Chinese virus. Have you heard of any intel of saying more in depth the where this thing came from and what its origin? I've heard people say oh, it was biological weaponry or something like that, all these different tales. What is your expert opinion on all this stuff with COVID? Is it just a bad flu bug? Well, I think that uh, in essence, uh, I have not seen any definitive evidence uh, specifically claiming that it was purposeful on the part of you know, the Chinese intelligence service. Okay. Uh, I, I, but then again, I'm not a pandemic expert by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, to me, um, if you just look at the history of uh, influenzas and pandemics, you know, most of them uh, are uh, naturally occurring versus being, you know, purposefully uh, put into uh, the public. But, um, you know, there's a lot of great minds that have, have looked at this thus far. And it appears to be something that was just naturally occurring and, and did not come out of a, uh, a laboratory, to the best of my knowledge. Got it. Okay, fair enough. I know people would be wondering that, too, that are listening to the audience. Uh, by the way, um, this is Fred Burton, and he's the Executive Director of Ontic Center for uh, Protective Intelligence. And this is Mark Ledlow, and I'm the owner of the Ledlow Security Group and um, also running – the podcast, Fearless Mindset Podcast, and uh, Fred's here just sharing with us um, experiences with the State Department and, uh, and 
for detective intelligence, and uh, we're just uh, glad to have him on the show. I, he has got a couple books. So if you guys want to read his books, he's got the one under fire and the other one he just mentioned a minute ago. Um, uh, please read those books as well. And um, yeah, Fred, um, just want to put that plug in there for you so people know. Thank you. Who's who's this guy he's talking to today? <laughs> but uh, welcome to the podcast world. It's kind of crazy. Um, yeah, another thing that just crossed my mind too was the fact that you know, are we going to be seeing another like another nine eleven? Are the have you heard like has Hezbollah and Hamas are they are they reorganizing? I know Trump talks about he just dis- distinguished them all and killed them all, but those guys are they have a different uh, value system than we do, different ideology, and um, because of that, they hate you know the infidel. And we are the infidel and, and their culture. What what is uh what are you hearing out there as far as oncoming threats, new threats from those uh type of cells out there? Well, I think if you look at uh Hezbollah, a group that I've been certainly following since uh nineteen eighty one, uh you know, the group is uh, a, a legitimate political party now in Lebanon. Uh they control certain areas of the country. Uh in many ways, uh, Beirut uh, is under Hezbollah control. Uh, they have um, a, a very robust and capable intelligence and security service that uh, has been uh, very much propped up by the Iranian uh, Ministry of Intelligence and Security, as well as the uh, Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard. Uh, they get uh, a fair amount of direct support from the Iranians, uh, and historically, this is a, a group that has been used uh, as a tool of foreign policy for the Iranian government uh, to pretty much target uh, the United States and Israel and, and our, our personnel, uh, predominantly in the Middle East, but they certainly have had capabilities to reach out around the globe. For example, uh, my old office was dispatched uh, on, on at least two occasions to BA Argentina, where uh, Hezbollah was responsible for the bombing of the uh, Jewish daycare center and, and uh, Israeli embassy in, in Argentina. Uh, and so they have a global reach. And now, uh, having said that, uh, COVID has certainly put a damper on uh, uh, Lebanon. Uh, they have uh, the same kind of problems that, that many nations are struggling with, was just trying to deal with the pandemic. So, you know, these are groups that have been around since, uh, in Hezbollah's case, so since the early 80s. Uh, and from a strategic perspective, you know, will be around in the foreseeable future, uh, looking at uh, targeting America and Israel. So, you know, I think that um, if you look at it from our enemy's eyes, so to speak, that uh, they're very much looking at the U.S. election from that context, sitting back and waiting to see who is going to be elected, uh, and then uh, relook at their foreign policy objectives, uh, their initiatives, uh, as to what could happen next. You know, if you look at Iran, which, um, you know, since 1979 has been a thorn in our side, uh, they have horrific COVID pandemic problems running rampant inside the nation. So they've been overwhelmed with COVID to a large measure, and they certainly do not have the sophisticated medical services that we have here in our great nation. So, you know, countries under a lot of pressure today. So, uh, you know, time will tell as to what they intend to do next from a foreign policy perspective. So a lot will dictate from political foreign policy, whoever the next administration will be on how they're going to hit us. Right. And, you know, the one thing I've learned, um, you know, having worked in democratic administrations and Republican administrations and watched them come and go is, you know, in, in many cases, uh, the president, our, our leader has constraints from a foreign policy perspective, meaning, yes, they, whoever is elected can come in and change foreign policy initiatives or support for certain countries uh, or national level kind of issues. But, you know, each nation state operates on constraints, whether that be geography, um, as well as foreign policy, as well as allies, 
And then if you look, you have uh, certain outriders, such as the pandemic that comes into play, that, that puts us all in the same sheet of music. So, you know, from, from my perspective, I, uh, as, as horrific as this pandemic has been, the one thing that it has shown us, shown the world, is that it is important and critical for us uh, as a world to try to look at um, strategic solutions to contain this kind of problem. Now, you know, certain nations will learn better than others, uh, but I think, um, you know, America has pretty much always led the way when it comes to this kind of initiative. So uh, it's really interesting to me to see what's going to come out of that. You know, I think one of the takeaways, Mark, has been uh, speed, meaning that uh, the, the, the need for speed when these kinds of events start to unfold is critical, but it also shows the need for accurate intelligence to be able to, to see exactly what you're dealing with and then to very quickly try to contain and get a handle on that. You know, but I, I also am, am uh, I'm a bit fearful that, you know, certain problems, Mark, from a historical perspective, um, are, are too big to handle. And, you know, maybe this is one that just might be too big for even the United States to handle alone. And so it's going to take, you know, a very strong global kind of response and process to deal with it. Now, as far as COVID-19 goes, do you think we have, an, you said earlier, you mentioned that we may have another year of maybe 2021 of it. You probably mutate. You didn't say mutate. You didn't give any like scientific stuff like that, but I'm, I'm kind of interjecting that from what I'm hearing that it could mutate from different medical friends that I have out there. It can mutate, and once it mutates, they have to get a new vaccine, a new um, whatever they call that antibody treatment. Is that kind of what you're hearing too? Yeah, I think uh, predicated on all the research I've done and all the studies I've read, I, I think the um, COVID is not going away anytime soon, perhaps not in our foreseeable future until a vaccine can be developed. But then again, you do have that mutation effect. And then right now, what's troubling is as we moved into the October, November, December timeframe is we're coming in for uh, flu and influenza here in the United States, which has historically uh, caused a lot of problems for, you know, certain uh, medical challenges that you might have yourself or uh, the elderly inside the United States. So, um, you know, this is uh, the kind of challenge that I think from a medical perspective that we're going to be dealing with, you know, over the next 18 to 24 months and, um, you know, how uh, we as a nation adjust to that, not only in the school, but in the workplace and travel uh, and in our business to me is, is you know, time will tell. Wow. That was a loaded answer, <laughs> but great content. Yeah. Gary, great information. It's just the reality we're living in and uh, whether or not you're, you know, didn't really matter what side of the aisle you're on. It is a virus we have to contend with. It's a new enemy. The, the invisible enemy as Donald Trump puts it, but um, it's uh, something we got to be mindful of. And like I'm working here in a, uh, up in Oregon on a, a corporate security project as a consultant and uh we have to be quarantined for seven days as a team and then once we're safe and tested negative we could go out and do our work and uh then that that took place and um now we're here you can't leave the bubble and then it's just the way corporations have to operate yeah and if you think through that logistically you know one of the things that to me is uh, fascinating in this business Mark, and you know, you certainly know this from from your experiences. Is, you know, if we if we wound back the clock, and let's say a year ago, you had gone to your boss, or you you own your own security company, and I worked for you, and I went to you, and I said, hey, Mark, you know, I've been doing some research and studies, and I'm putting together an emergency action plan. I know we're going to have a pandemic. I know the world is going to be shut down, and none of us are going to be able to go to work and all the schools are going to be closed. You would look at me and say, you know, Fred, do you have something better to do? You know, what makes you think that's going to happen? 
So here we are. So, you know, for me, uh, this is, you know, some will, will, will call this a black swan moment, but it really hasn't been. You know, pandemics has been something that the Pentagon and the intelligence community and the public health services for a long period of time have been doing some forecasting and warnings on. Just nobody wants to listen. And, uh, you know, I have a very good friend uh, that's a former um, CIA uh, great thinker by the name of Carmen Medina. And, and I was uh, talking to her not too long ago for, for my podcast. And she was saying that the moment you raise worst case scenario to your boss or to your CEO, they don't really listen. Mm. And so you have to start thinking about how are you going to frame your discussions with your boss or your owner or your CEO now in light of the pandemic, meaning, you know, now everybody is uh, well aware of the pandemic and the ramifications, not only from a personal level, the tragedies that, that we have suffered as a nation with just loss of life and, and sickness, the economic devastations, the operational capabilities. But if you had thought about this a year ago, nobody would have planned for it. So right. what is out there on the horizon that could hit us next to me is one of those kinds of thought leadership things that we all need to think about. So, you know, perhaps there's a need for that kind of uh, assessment inside of every security division and company to kind of forecast what could be coming. And you might have some ears now in the C-suite that are very interested in knowing so they can start planning for that in light of what has transpired. A totally different type of program, not really even uh, EP centric, but more almost medical first aid uh, centric to uh, two different paradigm shifts taking place. Right. For example, um, if, if, if I, let's just pick a topic that you read about, we've all studied and read about forever, um, an EMP attack. Well, the probability of that is highly remote. Sounds like our pandemic. What are the chances of that occurring? Remote. Well, what if it occurs? Now it raises a different kind of uh, equation. So you start thinking about those kinds of topics from just a blue sky perspective or just from a forecasting perspective. This enables, you know, a, a lot of us in this space to start thinking about what else could be out there. You know, look, I know from the first World Trade Center attack that the first one in 93, that if you would have Inside the intelligence community in 1992 or 1993, if you would have raised this, you would have had all kinds of people say the probability of an attack like that on, on U.S. soil is highly remote, and yet it happened. Right. Fast forward to 2001. The probability of that kind of attack is highly remote, but yet it happened. It did, right. And, and so here we are now in one of those – highly improbable kind of events and yet it happened. So what else is out there from a highly improbable event that could happen? Mm -hmm. Wow. Different way of looking at things. Here we thought, you know, the gangs were a big problem in the United States. And now you don't hear too much about gang warfare, you know, because everything is focused on COVID-19 and the elections. Yeah, and you don't even know about the gang attacks going on and the turf war going on because everybody's consumed and obsessed by no by november 3rd and so you know the media you know, being the media you know they have they're all their viewpoints but you know as a marine as a security agent as an operator i'm like okay what's the the newest next threat going to be in the state side on our on our soil what do we have to watch out for is it going to be you know human trafficking by the cartel is it going to be you know cells coming in from overseas to do more 9-11 type incidents and a lot of unknowns, but that's why protective intelligence is so important. Yeah, without a doubt. It, it at least uh, this window of time gives us all in this profession an opportunity to think about these big picture issues so we're prepared for them uh, as we go forward. 
So how do you, well, I'll change the subject a little bit. How do you relax and not think about all the craziness in the world? <laughs> well, I'm afraid I've been thinking about the craziness of this world since 1981. So it's, uh, it, it kind of comes with the territory and the turf, but, um, uh, sure. You know, I think it is important for all of us to kind of step away at times and and read topics that you're interested in. You know, uh, you have to always stay current. You have to always stay, uh, you know, abreast of the news. And, you know, the, the term situational awareness is thrown around a lot, but, you right. know, it's never been more important than it is today. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, we all just have to keep moving forward. And, you know, I think that's one thing about Americans that um, – uh, you know, it's something that's almost in our DNA that uh, we are very good at adapting to to challenges regardless of what is thrown our way. Yeah, we're great overcomers, very resilient of a country. Absolutely. And every generation, you know, typically is faced with challenges that we can't anticipate. But, uh, you know, in, in some ways, this pandemic has opened a window for us to be able to think about that going forward. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we covered a lot of uh, content, a lot of information, Fred, and uh, I appreciate your time on here. And I know uh, you got stuff to do. And uh, just thanks for uh, being open and willing to share your valuable insight on the, the country and the elections and possible threats with all the viewers and the audience.